condition, just as thirst is. On the cross, Jesus said, I thirst. And after the resurrection, he appears to his disciples in the upper room and he asks, do you have anything to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence, scripture tells us. Well, that's physical hunger. Jesus satisfied people's physical hunger when he multiplied the loaves and fishes and changed the water into wine. But you know what, there is another kind of hunger, and that's spiritual hunger. Jesus talked about this kind of hunger in the Beatitudes when he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And he himself experienced physical hunger and spiritual hunger. He said, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Spiritual hunger. And when at another time Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. After Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes, the people followed him around. They wanted more free food, in a sense. And why not? Jesus, if he had been a a huckster, we could say, would have obliged them and he would have given them more free food. And he could have become famous, perhaps, to the point of overthrowing the government in that day. But he chose not to do that. He chose not to go down that path. He was never self-serving. He never drew unnecessary attention to himself. Instead, Jesus challenged them to face the deepest hunger of their lives, the spiritual hunger, the hunger for meaning, the hunger for purpose, the hunger for real life. You know, as human beings, we hunger for so many things besides food and drink. And all of these things have a spiritual component to them. For example, we hunger for a feeling that we're important and that we matter. Nobody wants to be a nobody. We all want to matter if just to one other person. Maybe our jobs make us feel important. Maybe the love, the attention of our spouses and children make us feel loved. But what happens when we retire or lose our job or loved ones separate themselves from us? Well, we also experience the hunger of acceptance If we are not accepted, it becomes almost impossible for us to be ourselves. Parents want to be accepted by their children. Grandparents want to feel accepted by their grandchildren. Pastors want to feel accepted by their parishioners. But what happens when we say or do something, either out of necessity or perhaps by mistake, that makes us feel no longer accepted. Then we hunger for relationships. When I came back to the United States after 22 years abroad in West Africa and then in Italy, uh, it felt like I didn't have any relationships. My parents had died by then. The Dominicans who were here in the United States, many of them didn't know me. They had entered the order during my uh, 22 years abroad. And I felt, to be frank, that at that point, I didn't matter to anyone. Nobody wants to feel that way. But what happens when a spouse or a friend or a colleague die or in some other way leave us? We have a hunger for meaning. Without it, we're like a sailboat without the wind. We go nowhere. 
Maybe our professions provided us with a sense of meaning, but after we retire, no more sense of meaning or purpose. Maybe our salaries give us a sense of meaning, but what happens after that? We also hunger for hope, for something to look forward to. Primo Levi was a Jewish writer who spent years in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. And he once said, many suicides occurred immediately after the liberation. But by contrast, suicides were rare during imprisonment. In my own case, release was a critical moment which coincided with a flood of rethinking and depression. As long as we have something to look forward to, we have a chance of thriving or flourishing. But once that has been attained, many times people give up. And of course, who doesn't hunger for love? If this was fully satisfied, then most of our other hungers would probably disappear. We hunger for so many things that are good and right and natural. St. Catherine of Siena said, only something greater than ourselves can ever ultimately satisfy us. And the only thing greater than ourselves is God himself. And so let us listen again to the voice of Jesus. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. The bread that Jesus is talking about is himself, which we encounter in prayer, in the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, which we're celebrating at this very moment, but also in our human relationships, in scripture, in the church, in our local parish. It's in scripture where especially we encounter the many life-giving truths that Jesus reveals to us. He teaches us, for example, that there is a God who is not remote. He lives in us. And instead of being a kind of solitary force in nature, like lightning or something, as we might imagine him, he's not at all like that. He reveals himself to be a father who is close and concerned. And he wants to be in relationship with us. He calls us friend. And then Jesus discloses God himself as the human face of God. That's one of my favorite expressions for understanding Jesus, the human face of God. And Jesus tells us that God has a heart that he's not impersonal like a computer. In fact, his heart is a broken heart, a heart that is continually sacrificing itself, giving of itself, despite our ignorance, our insult, and our indifference. Jesus shows us what it means to be fully human. He shows us that it's only in giving ourselves away to others and in a supreme way to God himself that we ever find ourselves, that we flourish. Jesus shows us that we are not some things. We are some ones who are called to participate more and more in God's own life, his truth, his beauty. We are not objects or commodities or tools to be bought and sold. And he also shows us that we are frail and we're inclined to fall, that we find ourselves between uh, two trends, that downward pull of sin, but the upward pull of grace. He teaches us to be grateful because everything we have, including our next breath, is God's gift to us. 
and he shows us the importance of trusting in God, particularly during the storms of life. Now, some people deny that man and woman have a spiritual hunger. They might see it only as a psychological need. And so some people try to satisfy their spiritual need, their hunger for meaning and purpose with created things and people. Recently, two billionaires, Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, spent millions and millions of dollars to go up into the stratosphere in space rockets. They've been criticized, actually, for it ever since. Did they really think that that was going to make them ultimately happy? I don't know. Only something greater than ourselves can ever ultimately satisfy us. And the only thing greater than ourselves is God himself. So what about us? Do we recognize our spiritual hunger? And if so, what are we doing to satisfy that hunger? Are we going to the right places? Are we going to Jesus to satisfy that? Because no matter how good so many causes may be, PETA or saving the dolphins or the porpoises or the giraffes or the elephants or trees, no matter how good those things may be, ultimately to put them at the center of our lives is not going to satisfy us completely. We're going to end up saying, is that all there is? As St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O God. That's the way we're made. That's the, made, the way that we're wired. Even human relationships, the best of them, can never ultimately satisfy us. And so in closing, how should we begin? Just a couple of words. How should we begin to satisfy our spiritual hunger by looking toward Jesus? Why not review your life? See where it's been going. See where you would like it to go. And then make an appointment to see a priest. We're blessed to have four of them here right now. Come in and talk. Go to confession. You can make an appointment to do that in the priest's office or come to the confessional here. Metanoia, a word that means conversion, turning around, is a central piece of the gospel. And it's always a good place to start. <laughs>